So, uh, should we get going? Just, just making sure that all the technical arrangements are set up for us to go. Um, and, uh, and I would just want to say, uh, on behalf of, of the University of Iceland and, and Bibrost, um, I want to say welcome to, to everyone. Uh, this uh, talk by Stuart Cunningham uh, is uh, So, so we're very happy um, to have this opportunity to have you here to, to speak with us. Uh, professor Cunningham is a, a distinguished emeritus professor at the QUT, uh, has held leading roles in uh, organizations that are focused on both creative industries, innovation, uh, social sciences, and humanities. Uh, and he's a leading thinker on the study of creative industries and media studies, uh, highlighting the topic from different perspectives, uh, including the social network uh, perspective, of which uh, I'm personally uh, particular. Um, but I believe uh, that we'll, we'll hear uh, today a little bit about the tension between um, science, or, 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 or more specifically, kind of the, the natural science-centered uh, view of, of innovation, and on, on uh, a view that uh, kind of includes also creative industries and other perspectives. Uh, I myself am somewhat of a reformed uh, natural science supremacist, um, having once founded a company, um, believing that we had a very diverse founder team uh, because we were majoring in different uh, engineering degrees. Um, I've now seen the error of my old ways uh, and, uh, and seen many uh, fruitful collaborations between uh, science, scientists and artists. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to look forward and, and look forward to uh, learning more about the uh, topic from, from you. Thank, thank you. you very much, Ma Magnus. And, and thank you all for um, coming today. Uh, very uh, wonderful occasion for me. Uh, and uh, I hope um, of interest to you. So the, the title, uh, Hidden Innovation, comes from a book that I uh, published uh, about 10 years ago, Hidden Innovation, Policy Industry and the Creative Sector. Um, and the, uh, the book opens with a, a real, sto a real life story. I was at a big in innovation conference um, a while back, and the warm-up guy said, well, as we're waiting, who are all the scientists out there? And uh, lots of scientists put up their hands. Then he said, well, what about all the lawyers? Where are you? And uh, lots of lawyers put up their hands. What about the arts people? Well, me and one or two others put up their hands. And he, he said, well, it's great to have the scientists here. They uh, plumb the depths of, of, the, of the natural world and tell us how, uh, why things work the way they do. Uh, the lawyers tell us the how of how to put it all together and the artists say, do you want fries with that? Now, I hope that you get the message. Um, I was taken aback by that, uh, that the people in arts are really producing nothing of great value and they're going to end up in service careers. The reality is that there are formidable barriers to uh, the full recognition innovation issued by the OECD, have until recently categorically excluded products, processes and services emanating from the creative sector. Major national innovation surveys often overlook uh, the, the creative enterprise because it's often too small to count. And policies to support innovation, such as R&D tax credits, business export advancement or large-scale collaborative research schemes, are designed very much with the sciences, the STEM 
uh, sciences, science, technology, engineering and maths in mind. And the creative sector is often not organised for or oriented aware, uh, oriented towards or, or even aware of a lot of these schemes in my experience. So this has given rise to um, something that um, C.P. Snow, the British novelist and scientist, called the two cultures a long time ago. It's been around for a while, this problem. And here are some uh, words from Snow. Between the literary intellectuals at one pole and the physical sciences at the other was sometimes hostility and dislike, but most of all, a lack of understanding. Broadly speaking, um, it's probably say, true to say that modern science in that very much, I suppose, that very Anglospheric, from the Anglosphere, the idea of science versus the humanities, science versus the social science versus the arts, uh, is, is a stronger, at least rhetorically, than it is perhaps in Europe where the term the human sciences, the social sciences and the natural sciences go sit alongside each other in at least some kind of rhetorical continuity. But certainly in my experience, modern science has become so closely associated with and regarded as the wellspring of the advancement of knowledge and technological process, that really um, innovation has been virtually soldered, fused with science. So innovation is a very much a contestable term. And at its simplest, it can mean ideas successfully applied um, or creative problem solving designed <coughs> to produce practical outcomes. The key, the key uh, I think, to innovation is that it's not the, crea the thinking up of a new idea, um, the creation of new ideas or, or, or new technologies or whatever, but it's the application of those ideas or technologies for realised or potential economic, social or public benefit. That's, that's the key difference between um, ideas and, and innovation. And I think that that's a reasonable um, uh, thing to stick to around innovation. It's the application of, I of new ideas. But it, it, is, a f it is a very uh, contentious uh, term. And of course, Schumpeter, Joseph Schumpeter was um, always regarded, or has been always regarded as a key thinker uh, in the area, his term created destruction, the linked processes of accumulation and annihilation of wealth under capitalism, reminds us that innovation is very much a two-edged sword, a Janus-faced concept, a two-edged sword. And that rather dramatic phrase in the middle there, the competition from the new technology, the new commodity, the source of supply, strikes not at the margins of profits and the outputs of existing firms, but at their foundations and their very lives. Schumpeter was a, a, a great, um, a very a good writer, and um, <clears throat> to read some of his work is to be reminded of the, of the, uh, the huge challenges uh, that he threw down to, um, to economics in the mid 20th century. And of course, um, Beaumol's work um, has always been important as well. He asserted that virtually all the economic growth since the start of the Industrial Revolution is ultimately attributable to innovation. So I'm very well aware, I come from the humanities, I'm, I'm trained, uh, my first training was in literature uh, and then in film and then and media and communications. I'm very much from the humanities and I'm very, very, very well aware that uh, the concept of innovation is seen as a foreign body in the humanities where we, we have to deal with the fact that there are strong and diverse epistemologies of inquiry. I think one of the most useful ways of thinking of it is 
the scientific, which is predictive and universalizable, at least um, in principle, the humanistic, which is interpretive, explicit, analytical, and the practice-oriented, the, the artistic, which is interpretive, intuitive, and adaptive. These differences mean connecting to innovation thinking with its close alignment to science seem for many simply a category mistake. Now, when it's not regarded as a category mistake, simply dismissed as, as irrelevant in the fields that I come from, um, it's usually attacked uh, as another manifestation of um, everyone's favourite bogey word, neoliberalism. But I would argue that innovation systems are a relatively recent public policy framework that have only really been in place with, with real effect for the last uh, uh, three or four decades. And that it's a value-driven orientation to productivity and ultimately the quality of life. Good spruikers for innovation emphasise that growth and productivity, economic growth and productivity, is really a quality of life issue. It's not, it's not an economic issue per se. It's not the numbers. It's not the increased wealth per se. It's what that delivers for people in terms of quality of life. It's a, in, in the current um, uh, jargons, um, it's a well-being issue as much as a numbers and, and dollars or kroner issue. And it really stands in contrast to the deregulatory uh, uh, ideologies of the 80s and 90s. Innovation frameworks represent a historic shift, I would argue, in the ways in which government has thought of an appropriate role for intervention. Fundamentally, it's an issue about uh, the reason for, for government's attention and, and uh, intervention is around system failure, not market failure. It's around how to make the innovation ecosystem work better rather than the typical ways in which government orients itself, uh, at least to the creative sector, which is through a welfare model of market failure. So, as I say, I see that this as proposing a new role for government. And these, uh, this role stands, I think, in, in contrast to uh, those ideologies of neoliberalism that governments are, are around the world are emerging um, certainly very rapidly from um, since the global economic crisis of 2008-9 and, and, and of COVID. So, um, what one of the thing, one of the most interesting things that I've done in my career is to is to team up with an evolutionary economist, my colleague Jason Potts, and develop um, uh, what we call a, a four models model of the relation of the creative sector the rest of the economy. So the first model is, is a welfare model. Um, it's a, uh, and welfare there simply means that there are net transfers from um, the, uh, the public, uh, from uh, the public to, um, uh, uh, to the, art, the arts, in particular the arts sector. So these are, this is on the basis of market failure and of the public good nature or po positive externalities that the art sector provides uh, to society. Cultural economics is a whole sub-discipline that has grown up around uh, this rationale and is a, a thriving um, sub-discipline in economics. And it's usually, uh, this, air, this model is applied very much to the arts end of the creative industries. The, the so-called competitive model, Jason and I um, see as a established industries model. Um, it's uh, focused on regulation of large industries, um, the mitigation of their power. Um, you don't have the issue in this country that 
we and many other parts of the, particularly the Anglosphere do, of, of an extremely powerful and influential and politically motivated um, uh, media owner, Rupert Murdoch. Um, issues of media power loom very large in, in many uh, parts of the world and these kinds of and interventions to mitigate and, and, uh, and address such power as well as some of the great crises that, um, that face media today, particularly the demise of um, public interest journalism. These are issues for government intervention in this model. The third is a growth model uh, which emphasises the way creative inputs contribute to the wider economy. The creative industries in this model is seen as a driver of economic growth. Um, and that intervention is to invest in conditions for that growth rather than to address market failure. The fourth model <coughs> is an innovation model where we, where Jason Potts and I argue that the creative industries think of it as less of a particularly demarked sector in the world of GDP. <coughs> thinking, gross domestic product thinking, and see it more as, a, uh, as an increasingly important part of the innovation system. <coughs> Think of it as a general, like general purpose technologies. ICT is seen as a general purpose technology. And like it, creative inputs into, into the wider economy um, can be seen as a multi-sector um, uh, infusion of, of innovative thinking, design thinking, for example, in the wider economy. <coughs> um, so that's all interesting and it's an interesting argument and so on, but um, what did I do about it? <laughs> what did I do about the problem? Um, well, um, the thing that, the high point of my career uh, was that we bid for and won in national competition against all the hard sciences, a nationally funded centre of excellence for creative industries and innovation. Um, the words ARC, Australian Research Council, so funded by the... the there are two research councils in, in um, Australia. One is for the medical. It's for medical research. And everything else is under the Australian Research Council. And they're both basically funded to the same, roughly the same level. So we are bidding for everything ex against everything um, else than medical research. And, and so it was the first uh, centre of excellence funded out, uh, based outside the hard sciences in the country. <clears throat> And it offers, I think, um, I mean, the, the main reason I'm here in Iceland is to, um, at the invitation of Anna Hilda and, and the um, preparatory board for a multi-university research centre in creative industries that we um, spent a day working on yesterday, I think that this model um, offers um, a lot for that. Um, it may be that what I did uh, was at a, at a wider scale. Uh, at a high, uh, we, we were funded to 14 million AUD, Australian dollars. 14 million um, translates to somewhere about 1.2 billion uh, krona, Icelandic krona. Um, that was the public input and also we uh, had a lot of um, university funding and um, partner funding from um, Google through to um, the Red Cross and a range of other partners. Um, but what's the vision? The vision was a, the idea that we were dedicated to plugging gaps to improving weaknesses in the national innovation system. So it had a... what 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 we called a value chain um, approach, a rationale that said, okay, what's our research agenda? 
the research agenda is plugging gaps, fixing holes, improving links in the national innovation system. In practice, what it, what it meant was that we, we, we did major work around these areas, defining what the creative economy was. And I won't have time to go into those kind of details uh, today, but it involved um, working very closely with the National Statistics Authority. And finally, after uh, a decade and a half of, of work and advocacy, they adopted our methods, the so-called Trident method, which I can't go into today. Uh, and that led to the first satellite account for cultural and creative activity in the country. So that was a major outcome from our work. But it used evolutionary economics, policy analysis and advocacy. We, we looked at the nature and needs of and for a creative workforce, inputs from the education discipline, from labour studies. We were concerned about digital literacy questions, remembering back then, <laughs> so long ago now it seems, in the middle of the 2000s, um, YouTube was just getting going. And um, some of our younger researchers wrote the first book on YouTube, um, which is now um, you know, a, a, an international uh, bestseller and, well, for an academic work, bestseller, translated into a dozen languages. Um, we are on that cusp of that fundamental and profound change of the rise of social media. Uh, using digital media and cultural studies as an input. Um, we looked at creative enterprises and their sustainability with inputs from business, economics and intellectual property specialists. And we looked at legal and regulatory impasses. This was um, our, our group introduced the Creative Commons licensing suite to Australia, which was estimated by the end of the centre uh, independently estimated to have been worth 25 million AUD to the Australian economy. Using, again, intellectual property, uh, media and comms, uh, communications policy and, of course, law. So I hope you have a sense of, like, the rationale is a, is a, high, is a high concept rationale about why would you want to fund such a thing from the humanities and the social sciences. Um, so what did we achieve? And I'll, I'll just run through some of this very, very quickly. So at the end of the centre, we, in 2014, we claim to have made substantial progress around um, the statistics uh, question. And that led us to doing a lot of um, commercial research with a range of um, of clients, but also collaborating very closely with Nesta, who um, uh, we co-authored um, the very important dynamic mapping paper in 2013 that led to Treasury, uh, UK Treasury, um, uh, settling on a definition of the creative economy. Um, now, th these are some of the headlines fi findings that I presented yesterday about the um, about creative employment in Iceland um, and um, some of the very uh, the big headlines are the creative intensity of the of the Icelandic workforce is higher than um, a lot higher than Australia and um, and higher in some respects than Britain we didn't do the Nordic um, uh, comparisons because the, uh, the the data sources are, are, are too distinct um, if, if any of this um, uh, you want to come back to, um, I'd be very, very happy to come back to this in, in questions. Um, so the, the value of, of creative workforce, we, we did um, curriculum work, uh, we uh, collaborated with um, a number of um, uh, internationally on creative workforce policy and we published some, some big books. Um, this area of, okay, we start out at the, at the start of 
the social media age. And by the end of the centre, we've got um, lead people who are leading in this field, in the uh, like Jean Burgess and Axel Bruns. And if you look look these people up, they're 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 in some of the top cited people. Um, they've um, they're well ahead of me now. <laughs> um, uh, top cited people in the world in this field. Um, and they have um, now contributed to a new centre of excellence uh, based at, um, in Melbourne at the RMIT University with QUT as the second um, uh, biggest contributor uh, to a new centre of excellence in automated decision-making in society where a humanities and social sciences-based effort to really get on top of the downsides as well as the upsides of the digital age. We did, we did some um, we, we we did some spin-off work, uh, particularly around um, social innovation. Uh, we did a, a lot of work in business process improvement out of with business with um, out of business. Disciplines, uh, business IT disciplines on um, in, um, helping screen so, um, small and medium-sized enterprises uh, get their uh, business models in order. And as I said before, we did a lot of um, work, uh, practical and very measurable um, impact work on Creative Commons, opening up Crown copyright, uh, that is public copyright, to um, much, um, much wider use. And in the days when people thought that working with China was going to be a very, very important and, and unproblematic thing, um, we did a lot of work with and in China. We were the first. Um, we were the first um, people to um, organise with Chinese um, authorities the first creative uh, industries conference in China. And, and of course, China's gone on to be a leading policy player in this field, uh, for better and for worse. Um, so, um, wrapping up the last couple of minutes, um, that was all, that's all part of history now. Um, what have I done since then? Um, well, I've spent six years uh, at the latter end of my career on this whole question of creative inputs in the social media space, and had uh, we've done these five, these three books uh, with my collaborators, uh, David Craig. David Craig is a ex Hollywood executive who works at the University of um, Southern California. So we, we did social media entertainment, um, a big book uh, based on 350 interviews in 12 countries, uh, the global phenomenon that we call a new creative industry of, 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 um, of platformized cultural production. And with Jan Lin, we collaborated on uh, a book on <clears throat> the Chinese, the whole Chinese version of this, um, of Wang Hong. And uh, we also did a textbook for the American market uh, called Creator Culture. What is it? Well, um, a simple definition from one of its big thought leaders is any creator making all or part of their living making stuff on the internet or working towards that goal. Um, a little bit more academic um, from our book, commercialising and professionalising native social media users who generate and circulate original content in close connection with their communities on the major social media platforms. What's, what's the scope and scale of this? Well, this is one small aperture into the size of this industry. This is just YouTube. This is not all the other major um, 
major platforms. And of course, all of this work was done pre-TikTok. <laughs> so the entire uh, universe has changed in those last three years. Um, but in 2020, there were more than 2 million creators, that is, earning money on YouTube alone. Um, YouTube claims that they supported 142,000 equivalent full-time jobs in the EU during, uh, during the height of the pandemic, and, and so on. You can, you can read that on the screen for yourself. YouTube, in those three years um, into the pandemic, claimed they, they paid more than 30 billion US to creators, artists, and media companies um, through AdSense revenue. And so on. So th that gives you, a, I mean, these are all self-reported reported data. So, you know, you can, you've got to take them with a grain of salt because um, they're not subject to or independent audit. Uh, but it's big. <clears throat> and it, it does remind me of Robert Solow's, you know, the Nobel Prize winning economist who said back in the 80s, you can see the computer age everywhere but in the productivity statistics. Well, you can see social media entertainment everywhere except uh, where people are studying the creative sector. It's one of the classic hidden uh, creative industries. And on your theme for the next day, a couple of days here at the Social Sciences Assembly, you're, you're looking at questions of social innovation. <clears throat> this field, um, if you look at the, the bottom right part of the slide there, in a study a few years ago, they looked at diversity. So um, sexual, uh, gender, ethnic diversity. And the, this field got an A, games got a C, television got a C, and film got a D. This is U US. Obviously, low barriers to entry, very low barriers to entry mean a lot of new voices, a lot of marginalised voices, um, uh, a space of real social innovation. Why is this field so hidden? Well, it's hidden for um, reasons of newness, uh, it's, re it's hidden for reasons that it's hard to measure. And here are, here are some of the reasons that go directly to questions of um, um, the problems of national statistics in this field. You'll, um, some of you will be aware that there is a major review of the International Sta uh, Standard Industry Classifications, the ICICs. Um, uh, uh, revision 4 is underway and um, over time it will have major impact on all the big regional statistical frameworks. And the biggest of the lot will be the major restructure of information and communication. Social media entertainment won't be measured, even begin to be measured um, properly and well until all of that is probably done. So final, final slide, and thank you for, for um, um, attending to what I've had to say. What, what could and should government do about this? Well, firstly, the creative economy is a very diverse economy. It's got um, parts that are going gangbusters that are going forward very strongly in games, in digital, in AR, in VR, uh, in virtual production. And there are, are parts that are, have been massively hit by COVID, um, particularly the performing arts, and it will take a long time for many of the, uh, the uh, live music, performing arts to recover. The policies, therefore, have to be very, um, uh, they have to be diverse themselves. And, and the big challenge for government is to not think that creative industries is the arts. Of course, it's, the arts are a fundamental part of it, but 
from an economic calculation point of view, they are a very small part of a very big sector. So they've got to be uh, dealt with in uh, particular ways based on market failure and positive externalities. Large commercial creative industries, uh, as I alluded to earlier, need regulation but also new forms of intervention when we face the loss of public interest journalism. Um, most of the sector is small and micro businesses. They need, you know, they need access to schemes, support schemes that, that on, the, on, the, on the startup model. And an, inv an innovation and infrastructure framework would particularly focus, and I think this has great uh, relevance for Iceland, that the publicly funded cultural institutions have, should be seen as having obligations to stimulate, uh, to nurture, to facilitate small business creative industries. And last but not least, by any means least, education and training policies need to really grasp what the nature of a creative career is um, in the future economy. Thank you very much, Magnus, and to everyone. Uh, I hope we have some questions. Um, so, I covered a, a number of these um, points um, at, uh, yesterday, and we have we have begun uh, with um, uh, Anna Hilda's um, uh, great assistance, and with uh, working with Anton um, uh, Carlson at um, Statistics Iceland. We've certainly isolated um, what the uh, main issues are, and I'm sure you're aware of, aware of them, um, the, the, the issues are that the Eurostat model that you are required to conform to does not include the full range of creative industries and the particularity of Iceland's um, uh, uh, statistical databases is that we can't disaggregate to a fine enough level of detail the very large, and it's always the largest component of the creative industries in any country, and that is software, um, creative software, creative uses of software, creative applications of software, and uh, digital content. There is no way of being able to, disag to disaggregate those uh, to a level that is meaningful 
Um, and that is the source of a lot of the conflict, as far as I can see, in this country, where the, um, there, are, uh, there are interests in this country that want, uh, because they're IT-based and IP-based, they want not to be part of the creative industries because they see it as a definitional, pro it's just a major set of problems. And the, their problems are that the statistics aren't fine enough to have solved this problem that was solved by a great deal of, a great deal of first principles work that we contributed to in the early 2010s that gave rise to the dynamic mapping paper, the nest of paper in 2013 that's authored by one of our, one of my statisticians from the Centre of Excellence and Hassan, Hassan Bakshi. And, and uh, if you can do that, you can solve some of the key problems that this country f is facing. But it has to, that, that's, that's one of the main issues that I raise, you know, that I put to everyone yesterday. There are other issues, of course. Um, you can, and, and you can have, no, the, the, we, we had an hour and a half on this on yesterday. You've got, to st you've got to remain conforming to the Eurostat model. However, you can do things through concordance tables that enable you to do other things as well that capture a much wider range of creative activity, not only in the creative industries, properly measured, but also in the rest of the economy. So I was stressing yesterday the importance of skills as inputs not products as outputs. Don't just focus on GDP. Focus on skills as inputs. Look at creative employment, where it's occurring. Because that's where you get buy-in from education. It's where you get buy-in from, uh, from um, sectors other than culture and industry. Um, so I hope that's not too bellicose an, an answer. Um, but there are, there's a clear way forward. Um, you can, and, and with proper resourcing, of course, this could be done. Um, that's, it's, it's really now over to um, government as to whether they want it to occur. Yeah. So thank you. Um, and you did step back to a point that came up earlier that uh, statistics rather than the uh, industry were sensitive. Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, it's really important to, to understand that 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 is not to neglect the state of the industries. It's to attend to their critical inputs and what ca causes them to have been able to grow or to, rem to be sustainable and to link these what look like extremely esoteric little um, debates to the entire education system of the country, for example, to the question of STEAM rather than STEM. Um, and, and when people raise questions of steam, I always say steamed, not ste steam, steamed. Add another E and a D at the end, have entrepreneurship and design um, in there as well. But that's just me wanting to complicate things. Well, um, what we know about the, universe, the metaverse at, um, at this stage is that it is uh, designed, um, I mean, there are, there are 
obviously many um, companies that are working on this, but let's just stick with Zuckerberg's vision for the moment um, with Facebook. Um, it's, um, it's a really big money bet that um, some version of, immer of greater immersion that isn't, doesn't have all the problems of having to put on a great big pair of goggles in, a spe in, a, in some kind of specialised environment, not in entirely sure what that will look like yet. I don't think even the Facebook engineers do. But how you, how you become much more mobile without all of that on your face. But this immersive experience with, with a much greater degree of persistence, so you're not just signing in and signing out. You're going to be in there for much longer periods of time, uh, which are, is going to mean that um, Facebook's um, um, uh, advertising base is going to grow enormously again after now being on the decline. So it's, uh, that's a very lay um, read on it. It's driven by how to arrest Facebook's um, now serious decline vis-a-vis -vis TikTok and, and, and um, other players. Um, the fact that it's now not a cool place any longer, they want it to be cool again. Um, is it the same? Fundamentally, it's still driven by the same business model. I mean, it's very important to remember that these big, shiny um, uh, social media platforms are to a greater or lesser extent driven uh, by, by a very traditional model, which is advertising. 97% um, and more of the income of the major social media platforms, and, and Google's, Google is, is a search-based platform, not a social media platform, but it is also massively fed by advertising. So con very strong continuity. Uh, would be the, my first point. Um, the how how I, I am genuinely puzzled as to how you're going to get persistent, immersive experience without special, you know, something highly specialised. And everyone knows that Oculus Rift, which which Facebook bought, um, and which they thought they'd be able to, you know build out from, it hasn't gone well at all. You know, the, the, big, go the big goggles is not the, ro the route to persistent immer immersive experience. So what that's going to look like is, is really an open, a really open question, I think. Um, and I, I may be completely, you know, there might be a much better answer to that. And if anyone's got it, please tell me. also done a way to address it um, and you had some suggestions for the government um, and, and my question was uh, do you have any great ideas to uh, respond what I think would happen I think we probably who are besides selected people here uh, who are who are, who are you know, at this talk we would probably be very enthusiastic about those uh, about those policies but I could very much see like a, a fight for the limited resources for in many cases. So, so, so if we, you know, strengthen the creative industries, uh, kind of apart from STEM and so on, do you have any good ideas to kind of go from this competitive uh, atmosphere about the resources to, you know, something more synergistic? Um, you could walk away from uh, this talk and think, what this guy wants to do is to diminish STEM and upgrade creative. Well, that's not going to work. <laughs> um, you've you've got to you've got to be much more synergistic. Um, this this kind of 
these arguments were really about trying to at least get... I mean, when you go back to, um, 10 or 15 years, it's a very different situation. I think people now really intuit that, that what um, you know, the, the sociologist Scott um, Lash and um, uh, Lash and his colleagues do in this work um, the cult on the culturization of the economy, I think people now understand that. Platformization has uh, completely changed almost everyone's thinking on um, where culture is. I mean, culture's online everywhere. So this, these arguments, in some ways, almost predate that. It's to try and get a hidden sector up on the agenda. I think that agenda is pretty is in people's faces now, and so the question, um, and 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 you know, policies to to support STEM are good policies. Um, we need more uh, people in, in STEM. Um, STEM is, is a hard space to recruit people to, uh, some, partly because it's extremely demanding. Um, uh, you know, there, not everyone in the world can do a, you know, advanced um, calculus. Um, not everyone can do... Um, the kind of high-level coding that goes into um, um, the sort of immersive experiences that we were just talking about. So STEM is is very hard. It doesn't mean that that, there, that other um, disciplines aren't hard, but we've got to look for synergies. Um, we've got and any any large-scale research program of the sort that I've been talking about. In, in my country that doesn't do uh, a, a, a humanities, arts and social sciences, STEM confluence. If they don't bring these two, if they can't be seen to be bringing those together, they're not gonna, it's not gonna work. It's, it's now a key feature of um, uh, large scale research funding in, in my country at least. So yeah, we've got to find synergies and there are plenty to find. Um, it's not about talking STEM down in order to push something else up. It's not a zero-sum game. It's to find the fusion points, the, you know, the, the, the points where these, um, uh, these inputs are key. And you know, in the creative industries, games is a classic example of that. It's the ultimate fusion of, of art, business and technology. And, and a good, good trainings and education in that field are, are hard to come by. They're, and they, should, they shouldn't be. They should be, you know, really, you know, centre stage. I mean, in, 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 in my university, QUT, the, um, the um, games is located in the engineering faculty. Um, and... Um, and it gets inputs from over in creative industries. Um, why is that? Well, you know, there are particular institutional reasons, but, um, you know, the, where you've got fused uh, um, creative and STEM uh, fields, of which there are now many, then organise education and training around them. Uh, we're running close to the end of the hour, but I'm going to try to squeeze in one last question here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tarek Kjern, and I'm an associate professor at Georgia University. Um, I have just a very quick question about sort of the education society and sort of the entities. And I wanted to ask, what are your thoughts on, on sort of how focusing on more mobility and digital and culture sort of impacts or the value in sort of social sector? Um, well, you know, once again, it's not a zero-sum game. Uh, it can't be. 
Um, <clears throat> we live in uh, a complex world uh, where there are always um, competitions for our attention and our prioritisation. There's no um, question that one of the biggest problems that any new centre of um, multi-university research centre in creative industries in this country needs to attend to, it has to be about getting the definitions and the data right because if you don't have that, government has no way of dealing with you. That, I mean, it's as simple as that. You've got to be as, as um, visible to um, your funders as um, education or health or, or um, uh, infrastructure is. It's got to be seen as a, it's a walk-up, clear, it's, it's something that needs to be um, dealt with. So that's got to be done because otherwise it remains what one of the uh, players in this field in this country call, it's just a big soup. It's just a big, like, definitional mess. It's got to be fixed. Um, none of that uh, need detract from, and my sense is that the starting point for most people when they think about creative, the creative sector, creativity in this country, of course it, it starts with the public good value of its... Um, of the people of Iceland's deep understanding of their, uh, their distinctive culture, language, and all that goes with it. So that, that is almost like a default setting. But to, to go above the anecdotal on that is to also have to do rigorous research on that cultural value? What, how does it express itself? What are the cultural indicators that might be built into a well-being approach to budget thinking? What's the value of culture along with the value of a good education um, or of um, uh, uh, political freedoms of expression, etc.? These things can be done. There are methodologies for doing them. They need to be part of the agenda, and then it becomes a case of, okay, um, you know, what, how do you prioritise within those? But um, the social, the economic and the, and the cultural um, will always be in creative tension, and that's, that's the nature of complex reality. When it comes to questions of climate change, One of my um, uh, close co colleagues, Toby Miller, wrote a book on um, debunking the idea that the, um, uh, the uh, creative uh, sector and its IT base was in any sense green, greener than, you know, dirty, in, dirty uh, manufacturing industries. Um, very well aware of... The, uh, the technology base is a uh, huge user of resources. Um, the, uh, the issues there need to be um, faced as much as um, any industry approach to or any part of society's approach to the, um, the use of resources. Um, and whether they're contributing to, whether they're green enough resources. But there's also a whole social realm, which is that young people, it's very clear now, young, particularly young people who've got another 30, 40, 50, 60 years of their life in front of them, are much more aware of a sense of impending doom about the fate of the planet and that has to be built into our thinking as well. Um, it is a, a profound social challenge. 
uh, the question of, cult of climate change and how it finds expression and, and has, prior has deeper priority, higher priority in cultural representation here and elsewhere, everywhere. Thank you. This has been uh, extremely exciting. Um, and this brings us to the end of the hour. Thank you to Professor Cunningham and uh, uh, to everyone who is here and to the organizers of both universities for participating.